remain standing. We are going to do our affirmation of faith, 889 in the hymnal. There is one God, and there is one mediator, Christ Jesus, who came as a ransom for all, to whom we testify. This, this saying is sure and worthy of its full acceptance, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, and it was manifested in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed in throughout the world, taken up in glory. Great indeed is the mystery of the gospel. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. In place of our children's message today, we're having our back to school blessing. So I would like all the kids that want to participate to come forward and find a place at the prayer rail. And while they're doing that, if you are an educator, teacher, uh, school staff, any of that, if you could please stand because we would also like to have a blessing over you as well. I know there's some out there, so. <laughs> All right, once you guys, um, we're going to pray for the teachers first and then we'll go to the prayer rail, okay? All right, friends, let's join in prayer for our teachers and staff. Father God, we lift up all of our teachers and educators, teachers' aides, principals, tutors, counselors, volunteers, coaches, and anyone who will be impacting our students. We ask for your hand of blessing to rest on them as they prepare to help shape, mold, and educate our children in the year ahead. We pray that you would guide them as they set out to lead our children, equip them with the necessary tools and resources for the year ahead. Lord, bestow them with wisdom and understanding to best know how to care for each individual student that fills their classroom this year. Protect them and give them what they need to ensure a successful school year. And when the days are long and the students may be restless, give them the ability to keep going, knowing that they are making a difference. And when they feel like no one notices or appreciates the work that they do, remind them that there is one who sees and knows. Equip them to be Christ to their students every day, that their students would get a glimpse of you through them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. All right, kids, let's go over here so that we can, y'all can kneel and we can pray over you, okay? Let's pray together. Dear God, I pray over Makai today and ask that you cover him with your protection and prepare him for a new school year. Nurture and build him up physically, emotionally, and spiritually, and help him be a light for you in every circumstance. Fill him with a hunger to learn and a heart filled with your love and grace, trusting that you are always with him. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, Karen, you ready, honey? Here we go. Dear God, I pray over Karen today and ask that you watch over her and keep her safe as she starts school. Help her to be brave, joyful, and kind as she learns new things and makes new friends. Help her know that you are always with her. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay. Okay. There you go, Good idea. Good job. <laughs> And then after um, the 11 o'clock worship today, we'll have a bouncy house and Kona ice cream, or sorry, snow cones for everyone out in the front, and then the bounce house will be out in the back. Well, I have several uh, folks I'm going to ask you to pray for today, and, um, and you know there's a lot going on in the world right now, too, and so we have a lot of things to lift up in prayer today. Um, through different circumstances out in their lives, um, not connected here to the church, but Sonny Bradley, Don Elliott, and the Humphreys are all uh, dealing with COVID right now, so please be keeping them in your prayers. The service for Mike Sweeney is going to be this afternoon at 3 o'clock, so please be praying for the Sweeney family. The family has requested that anyone attending the service wear a mask. Um, we're asking for prayers for Trudy, Harvey, that's Benny's wife, 
Um, she is in the hospital um, really struggling with pneumonia, and it's really hard whenever your loved one's in the hospital and you're not allowed to go in and see them. So uh, keep Benny in your prayers too. Um, Jackie Brunswick also asked for prayers for her cousin Amelia and Jesse Reese, a young couple with a baby, and their house burned down this week. And uh, fortunately, they were all safe and everything, but they, they lost everything. So, so we'll be lifting them up in prayer too. Let's go ahead and bow our heads and our hearts as we go to the Lord today. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, this morning we are so aware of our blessings. First of all, we want to say thank you for making us. Thank you for our very lives. Thank you for the homes that we had to wake up in this morning and our beds and our food that we could eat. Thank you for our families. Thank you for giving us your love, even in times when we feel upset. We thank you for helping us when we are sick. We pray that you would be with the homeless and the poor this morning, that they would know that they are not forgotten and that they are loved by you. This morning, we lift up the people of Haiti, who not only lost their leader several weeks ago, but now have endured a terrible earthquake yet again. We pray, Lord, that you would help them to find survivors and to have any idea how to start rebuilding again in the wake of so much chaos. We also pray for the people of Afghanistan uh, who are um, dealing with even more violence and unrest. We also ask for prayers for um, the families of American military whose family members sacrificed uh, in order for that to go well and all of the things they must be feeling right now. We pray uh, for your leadership and guidance. We pray that you protect the innocent. Lord, today we remember that you are said that you are the light of the world. And we know that on the first day of the week, you wondrously called forth light out of darkness. It was on the first day of the week that you raised Jesus from the dead. It was on the first day of the week that you powerfully formed the church through the gift of your Holy Spirit on Pentecost. And so today, prove yourself once again to be the light of the world. Remind us of the way that you can always bring life out of death. Fill us up with your Holy Spirit and make us one church united throughout the world once again, Lord. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you that you are steadfast. We thank you that you've never failed us yet. And we pray, Lord, that we would be people who share the light, knowing that even and you are even in the darkness before the dawn comes. We trust you. We love you. We thank you. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now is the time in our service where we take up the offering, and I invite you to participate in that today. Um, you know, the offering is a lot of people's least favorite time of the worship service, and yet it is really something for God to be able to say, here's what I'm doing in the world, and you get to be a part of it. Every time that you give a gift here, you're part of the ministries of this church, from the back-to-school bash that we're doing today, the grow groups that are starting up here in this next week or two. Everything that God is accomplishing through Asbury, you're, you get to be a part of that, and I thank you for all of those who give so graciously. There's lots of ways to give here in the sanctuary. There's offering plates by each of the doors. You can stand up in a moment and place your gift there. If you're at home, you can just place a check in the mail. You can also give through our website, asbury.cc, and click on the Give Now button. You can give through your own bank online, which is what we tend to do. And you can also give through text message. Thank you to all who are part of what God's doing here.
a seat. Thank you, choir. That was beautiful. You know, I was noticing that the green banners are back up today, and um, I wonder how many people know what that ship there signifies. I don't know if you know this, but most sanctuaries are built with a, an angled roof, just like this one, and the purpose of it is to remind us of the ark, actually, the idea of sanctuary, that in the midst of any storms going on in our lives, that this is a place where we are safe, that we are with the Lord, and that we are reminded that we have sanctuary in Him. And that is such a good thing to remember on, well, any time, but on a day like today too. Let's pray together. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be found to be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I remember going to my cousin's wedding a number of years ago. 
it had been thrown hastily together, and we were um, all gathered together there in my aunt's house. The groom's family was there on the front row of the groom's side, and I remember uh, that we quickly realized why they were there, and it was not to support their son. It was so that as soon as the pastor began the service, they could stand up and walk out. It was one of those moments that stays with you, uh, that you remember really clearly, precisely because it was the opposite of what should have happened in that moment. The sacredness, the holiness of family is that it is the best approximation of unconditional love that we have in human relationships, or at least that's what it's supposed to be. The closest that we get to God's unconditional love existing between two people of flesh and blood. Family sticks together through thick or thin. You still sit down next to that relative who annoys you or you don't trust at Thanksgiving, and you know that they're going to be a part of your family until one of you passes away. You don't just get rid of family. You don't disown your family. You don't stop being family just because there's a rift, some hurt, some extreme annoyance. You might not be as close, but family is still family. And boy, did my cousins and laws blow it. <laughs> now, in cases of abuse, of adultery, a stepping away from some family can certainly be the right thing to do. But even when it is the right thing, it doesn't feel right. Because the divine purpose of family, the basic nature of family, is to be the location on earth of unconditional love. As close as we can get to God's unconditional love between two people. Friendship is different. And it's mainly different because it's more precarious, less of a surefire thing. Friendship can provide many of the same benefits as family. Sometimes friends can become even closer than family, particularly if there's a lot in common and some shared experiences. But a friend can always choose to walk away. If a friendship becomes unhealthy, or if somebody moves, or if somebody just tires of keeping up with people, a friendship is always a choice. It can be there one day and gone the next. It's awesome when there's unconditional love and a friendship, but there usually isn't. And it's not an expectation, which is part of what makes friendship so sweet. If somebody continues as a friend year after year through all the ups and downs, it's not because they have to, like family. It's because they choose to, which makes it more rare more special. Your friends are in it with you because they want to be. For the next six weeks, we're going to be talking about different places in our lives where we can have an encounter with Christ. Of course, the the fundamental, the first place that that happens is in the Bible, right? In the Bible, we get to know Jesus and really get a sense of who God is. But there are lots of different circumstances and relationships in our lives where Christ can actually come into that moment and speak to us through that person or that thing. And so for the next six weeks, we're going to be talking about those different kinds of things so that we are on the lookout for how God might be speaking to us. Today, we're talking about how we can encounter Christ through our friends. But some friends have more in the tank than others. They have a deeper well. Some folks just have greater capacity to pour into you, to lift you up, to motivate you, to be the kind of companion and confidant you need than others. Some friends, over time, it becomes apparent that they're just not able to be as good of a friend as you'd hope. Maybe when hard times come, they start to pull back, or they turn on you without hearing the full story. Some people are caught up in their own mess too much to really be there for you when you are in yours. And we have to grieve that the friendship wasn't what we thought. We need to forgive. We need to hand it over to the Lord. We need to move on. But then there are friends who stick with you. Friends like, well, the kind of friends that a guy named Job had in the book of Job in the Old Testament. Job was a, had a good group of loyal friends, and for a long time, Job had everything you could want in life. A great family, health, lots of land, enough livestock and crops to be secure. He had the ancient equivalent of the American dream. 
And then in one day, he loses it all. A storm causes the roof to cave in on his children, killing them all. Raiders take his livestock. There's a fire on his land. Later, he develops an illness and has a painful skin condition. Everything but his wife has been taken. and She doesn't seem to be a great source of support, living in her own grief. Almost the entire book of Job, about 40 chapters, is about him trying to figure out how to live beyond his loss why a lot of people really connect with the book. And throughout this time, he has a group of friends who I believe did their absolute best. Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. You don't, they didn't just send Job a gift basket or a card when these troubles came upon him. They come to Job face to face when he's suffering, and they empathized with him. They grieved with him. They wept. They tore their robes. They put dust on their heads. These were signs of grieving back then. And they sound kind of odd to us, but honestly, they grieved in a more healthy way then than we usually do. So many times we just try to suppress it like you know, nothing happened. They don't shy away from Job. They lean in and come alongside him in his time of need. And they spend a really good amount of time with him, not just once, but day after day. They show their care consistently. In fact, we're told in Job 2 verse 13 that they were with him for seven days in a row before they even spoke up. They just let their presence minister. These are good friends. People who are there for you when you need them. But then they opened their mouths. <laughs> and you have friends like this. They mean well. They just don't know what to say. And this is where things go from good to not so great for Job. Because they clearly do not have a spiritual well to pull from when Job needs it. Throughout the entire book, they spend verse after verse, chapter after chapter, day after day, prodding Job to figure out what he messed up in his life that caused all these bad things to happen to him. They're saying stuff to him like, look, you must have done something wrong for God to let all this stuff happen. What could it have been? Maybe if you had just prayed a little harder, that's what some people say these days, then this stuff wouldn't have happened to you. By chapter 16, Job has had enough and turns to them and says, you are miserable comforters, all of you. <laughs> we have friends like this. Not necessarily that they would talk like that to us, but it's just that when we are dealing with something, maybe they just don't have the spiritual deep well to say what we really need to hear. Maybe they just cannot be Christ to us in that time. They haven't given enough of themselves to God to shape and form them. Maybe they don't have the courage to say what we really need to hear in a kind way. Maybe the best that they've got is misguided attempts at helping or fixing or whatever, and you appreciate them. You're grateful that at least they stuck by you. That's the basic foundation of any decent friend. They're there. But they really can't be what you really need the most. That's okay. You can be grateful for what is without focusing on what isn't, but there is a different kind of friend out there. And there was a guy in the Gospels who was lucky enough to have this kind of friend in his life. And we're going to read his story this morning. I encourage you to grab a Bible and open up to the Gospel of Mark in chapter 2. You might see a blue Bible in one of the chairs in front of you. You can grab that and take a look, or you can just pull it up on your device, whatever works for you. I'm reading from the CEB version this morning. Read from whatever works. We're going to be in Mark chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. That's after Matthew and before Luke. You can see pretty far back in my Bible. All right, here we go. After a few days, Jesus went back to Capernaum, that's at the Sea of Galilee, and people heard that he was at home. So many gathered that there was no longer space, not even near the door. Jesus was speaking the word to them. Verse 3, some people arrived, and four of them were beginning to were bringing to him a man who was paralyzed. They couldn't carry him through the crowd, so they tore off part of the roof 
above where Jesus was. And when they had made an opening, they lowered the mat on which the paralyzed man was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, child, your sins are forgiven. That's interesting. Some legal experts were sitting there muttering among themselves, why does he speak this way? He's insulting God. Only the one God can forgive sins. Jesus immediately recognized what they were discussing, and he said to them, why do you fill your minds with these questions? Which is easier, to say to a paralyzed person, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take up your bed, and walk? But just so you'll know that the son of man or the human one has authority on the earth to forgive sins, he now says to the man who was paralyzed, get up, take your mat, and go home. Jesus raised him up, and right away he picked up his mat and walked out in front of everybody. They were all amazed and praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Okay, this man, and we don't even actually know his name, and he never actually speaks. Did you notice that? But there's something about him. Now, let's be clear. Many of the times that we have troubles in life, they are brought to us by forces completely outside our control, accidents, hurricanes, random illness, it's external. All of a sudden, this trouble is just plopped right down in our laps. But sometimes in life, and only sometimes, we bring trouble on ourselves. People text while driving, or they get drunk and they have car accidents, right? Some bad habits can lead to cancer. We say something horrible to a friend, and that relationship gets strained. Sometimes the troubles we have, we bring on ourselves. And that's the case with this man. We don't know what happened. Maybe he was sneaking out to steal something in the dead of night, and he fell, and he was paralyzed. We don't know what the specifics were, but we do know this. There was some sin in his life that was related to his current trouble. Jesus sees this. He knows it. But that's not the only thing he sees. He also sees this is one of God's kids. He wants to offer grace to this man, and he sees the faith of this guy's friends. There must have been something good about this guy that his friends are willing to go to bat for him. Not only are these guys with him, like Job's friends were, these friends are not going to stop. They are not going to give up. They're going to fight for this guy until his life is good again. And here is so what's, what's so amazing about these guys, the ones who carry him from who knows how far away, the ones who climb the rungs of a ladder propped up against a wall, the ones who figure out how to stand on the roof without it caving in while they are holding him on a mat at the same time, the ones who dig through the mud of the roof, remove the sticks, laid across the beams, and find a way to lower him through the roof until he is right smack in front of Jesus. These men didn't take their friend to the hot springs for healing. They didn't take him to the Dead Sea like where King Herod went when he got sick. They didn't just give him a little extra money or tell him that they were sorry. They know what he really needs. They know the only one who can give him what he really needs. He needs Jesus. God, you're right, Karen. And nothing is going to stop them. Even if they have to carry him on their backs, they are going to make sure that he meets Jesus. And it is their faith that is the channel for Jesus' grace and healing in this guy's life. That's the kind of friend we need. Someone who takes us and the heart of our trouble and plops us right in front of Jesus. That's the kind of friend we're called to be. A couple months ago, uh, Jay Lynn, one of our children's directors here, told me about an organization called Texas Adaptive Aquatics. 
it really spoke to me because I have a brother who's mentally disabled. And most folks would look at somebody like my brother Drew or some other person with a disability and say, look, water sports, that is just not an option for them. It is too dangerous. There's too many risks. They can't understand. You can't communicate. This just cannot be a part of their lives. But this nonprofit over on Lake Houston said the opposite. They bring the kids to the water. And they have all kinds of harnesses and seats and things to give them a safe, thrilling experience doing the kinds of water sports that other folks get to enjoy. Instead of saying, sorry, there's nothing I can do, they bring the kids down to the water. They get in the water with them. They take them to a source of excitement and belonging until that huge smile shows up on their face. Don't they look like they're having a blast? It's amazing. We need friends who can take us to the water, the living water. For those of you in school, you need to be finding a friend who can talk with you about God, who can pray with you. We all need a friend who actually understands how important God is and who can help bring us back to Jesus when we feel far away. Parents, grandparents, we need to be praying for our kids to find friends like that. We need to be praying for God to bring that kind of friend into our lives too or thank him for the ones he's already given us. We need to open up to them. We need to listen for God in them. And at least as importantly, we need to be that kind of friend to others. A friend who takes the people that God has placed in our lives down to the water too. Last week, I was talking to my friend, Luis. He's the pastor over at Cedar Bayou Grace United Methodist Church in Baytown. I was telling him about, you know, how things were going. And he looked at me and he said, um, you're discouraged, aren't you? Well, I'm not exactly known for being super in touch with my feelings. <laughs> I'm the kind of person that is way more comfortable thinking about things than feeling things. So I looked at him and I said, oh my gosh, you know what? I think I might be discouraged. <laughs> I mean, who hasn't gotten discouraged from time to time lately, right? So he asked me, hey, Lindsay, what do you do when you get discouraged? In other words, what are the pathways that God uses in your life to encourage you? And in the moment, I couldn't really remember. And so he said, what does your tradition tell you? What did your parents and grandparents do for you when you were young that helped you when you felt discouraged. And all of a sudden, he unlocked two answers for me that I never would have been able to discover on my own. First, my Nana would sing happy songs when she would get discouraged. And second, my dad would put his arm around me. And it wasn't so much his consoling that I remembered, but it was the fact that he would always make me laugh. And all of a sudden, I had a recipe ready-made that I knew would work because it had worked before. I needed to start singing again. And I needed to get in a conversation with a friend who I could talk to about what was going on, who knew God's heart and could still bring me to laughter. It was a recipe that I would not have been able to identify if it hadn't been for a friend who was able to help me see God's leading and guiding in the middle of it. And wouldn't you know it, that God put a song on my heart as Luis and I said goodbye to each other and went our separate ways. Do you know what song God gave me? I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. It was such a comfort. You know, just in this church, I know so many stories. I know stories of God providing jobs for people through godly friends. I know stories of people providing cars for people through godly friends. I know stories of God helping people get joyful and hopeful again through godly friends. I know stories of people encountering Christ through their friends. And we have gotten a reputation in the community as the church 
that perseveres in blessing our community. I was recently asked to be the leader of our One Church Pasadena Coalition of Churches that's engaged in the community, about 80 churches all together. We don't stop at logistical obstacles along the way here at Asbury. We are going to keep going until we have created an opportunity for people in the community to encounter Christ through us. I think one of the opportunities that we Christians have today is to help people remember how to tear down some roofs. People are stressed out and anxious. Friends are mad at each other over any number of differences of opinion. A lot of kids have grown up spending more time in front of screens than learning how to be a friend to a real live person. Great. There are a whole lot of people who need Jesus. And guess what? We know where to find them. Now is our time to pick up our friends out of their struggle and say, I know somebody who can help you. Whether you already know Jesus or not, pretty much everybody needs a friend who will say, let's go talk to him right now. Let's pray together, friend. Why don't you try that out with somebody in your life? For a friend who doesn't know Jesus, the Bible's a pretty great place to start. Tell him a few of those stories. Invite him to go talk with some other people who know Jesus so they can hear about him from them. Here's this worship band that's amazing. Let's listen to some of their music or let's listen to some Christian podcasts together or come sit with me at church. Let's read through this book of the Bible together. Let me tell you about what he's been up to lately in my life. I know Jesus and I can lead you to him. And we're not going to let barriers get in our way. Crowds and sticks and mud and heights, that's nothing. We're not going to let our own insecurities or the fact that we don't feel like spiritual experts or feel like we know the right thing to say all the time or our worry about how they're going to respond. We're not going to let any of that stop us. We won't settle for being like Job's friends, there for them, but not really able to give them what they really need. We'll bring a meal. We'll send a funny meme. Not able to get down to the heart of it. They need Jesus. Give them Jesus. Tell them about a man who left heaven behind to rescue them, who knows everything about them, who created them out of love for divine purpose, who is with them all the time, who can wash away anything, including the worst sins, and take your friend, and Jesus can make them a new creation if they will only let him. Give them hope. Give them joy. Give them Jesus. And tear down any dadgum roof you have to so that your friend can meet him. That is the kind of friendship God calls us to. That's the kind of friend you can be. And just to push a step farther, you probably are even being called to be that kind of friend to an enemy. Surely, if Jesus told us to love our enemies, friendship is a step on the way to loving. So I want to give you a nudge this morning. I want you to think of one person, one person that God might be calling you to be this kind of friend to. One person that God has directly placed in your sphere of influence that you could take the plunge and risk looking crazy just so that you could bring them to Jesus. And this week, share Jesus with them somehow some way. It can be big or small. God knows there's a lot of people who could use a friend right now, a godly friend. And if that's not where you are, if you just don't find yourself having a whole lot of God-given energy and confidence in Christ, that's okay. Christ can grab hold of just about anything and use it. Maybe it is your turn to pray for that kind of friend, and to stay on the lookout for the one that God sends your way, the one that can plant you and your heart and your hurt right in front of the Lord. Let's pray together. Jesus, this morning we remember that you invited us not only to be your servants, not only to be your brothers and your sisters, but you actually called us your friends. The idea that it's possible to be friends with God is just kind of hard to understand or imagine. 
Thank you for welcoming us into that. Surely, Lord, surely, we can take a look at the friendships you've placed in our lives and realize that you might be calling us to be Christ to one of our friends this week. Surely, we can look at our friends with an eye open, an ear open, for how you might be showing up for us through our friend this week. Lord, people are hurting. There's a lot of stress and grief. Friendships are one of the places in this world where we can encounter you. And they're right here with us. It's something we actually can do. It's something that we can actually participate in and make a difference in. Give us the courage, the confidence. In the Bible, you tell us that when we don't know what to say, the Holy Spirit speaks on our behalf. Make these things true for us this week, Lord. That even through our friendships, we encounter Christ. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Please join us in our closing hymn, whether you are at home or in the sanctuary. It's on page 273 in the hymnal. The title is, Jesus' Hands Were Kind Hands. Please stand and join us. Thanks for worshiping with us today, and I hope we get to worship together again next Sunday. But don't wait till then to connect with us. If you've got little ones, make sure you come back right around noon today for all the fun we're going to be having at our Back to School Bash. Ask me about grow groups that you could check out, small groups where you could learn more about the Bible and meet some friends. If you're interested in learning more about our church, connect with me after service. And I want to let you know that we have prayer partners who will be up here as the service closes. They would be happy to pray for you if you have something going on in your life. I will come back up to the prayer rail and uh, pray uh, with folks as well after the service concludes too. If you get a chance, uh, share our uh, worship on Facebook today so other family and friends can uh, worship along with us. And as we go from this place, remember God goes before us to show us the way, behind us to keep us moving, above us to watch over us, beside us to befriend us, and within us always to give us peace. Amen. Amen.